Hi. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody, for um, joining us for another cellular imaging uh, webinar as part of our ongoing series this year. Uh, today's topic is uh, contemporary automation and high-content imaging tools for screening stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes. We ha are very excited to have Michael Kowalski, uh, an application scientist with Beckham Coulter, and Jane Hesley, uh, an application scientist with Method Devices, talking about the subject. Uh, I just uh, wanted to dig a little bit more into the uh, uh, housekeeping. So for those who couldn't write down the WebEx technical support, there's a US 800 number up there, or you can send a Q&A, &A, uh, and uh, Mary Beth, who's online, will uh, help answer those technical questions. Um, we will take questions throughout the, uh, the, the talk, either technical or about the scientific subject at any time. Um, as Mary Beth mentioned, press on the Q&A button uh, at the top of your window. Uh, type in a question. Uh, make sure it's uh, targeted to all panelists. And then press the send button, and we will all see that, those questions. So um, the agenda is I'm going to do a short um, introduction, uh, and I'll also be a Q&A moderator as those questions come in. Uh, Mike um, is, a, is a staff application scientist in the sample preparation and applied markets group of Beckman Coulter, Mike Sciences. Mike received his PhD in microbiology and molecular, molecular genetics from Harvard University. Prior to joining Beckman, Mike was a postdoctoral fellow at the Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research, where he used automation to screen for novel regulators of stem cell pluripotency and differentiation. Since joining Beckman, Mike has developed automated applications in the areas of photophotometry, mass spectrometry, and stem cell culture and differentiation. So, he should be giving us a, a really interesting uh, talk about uh, optimizing those, those conditions there. Uh, Jane Hesley earned a Master's in, of Science degree in Biology from the University of Idaho. She's work, been working in um, uh, industry for nearly 25 uh, years. Uh, she started in uh, as a in research development group, but has experienced also in technical support, field application scientist, instrumentation, reagent training, product manager, is now in-house applications uh, for cellular imaging at molecular devices. So uh, why, why are we interested in the subject uh, that we're going to be talking about today? So it, it takes billions of dollars and many years to bring a drug down to the market. Um, and this graph shows sort of cumulative costs for co bringing compounds to market, uh, starting with discovery, uh, preclinical, clinical development, and here you're starting to reach those billions of dollars. And I've seen numbers actually uh, much higher than this for estimate, estimates of how long it takes to, how long and how much money it takes to bring the drugs to market. But <clears throat> um, only 5% of drug candidates make the market. So, um, and why do drugs, why do so many drugs fail? Well, the number one uh, uh, cost to, uh, cause of drug attrition is animal toxicity. And the most common candidate for attrition is cardiovascular which is the most common target organ, and liver is the second most common target organ. So that, and that same pattern for drug recalls, uh, so when something's already come to market, it exists. So cardiovascular represents 25% of recalls, and liver is 37% of recalls. And this is from data in the literature. So prediction of drug efficacy and toxic effects remains one of pharma industry's greatest challenges. The goal would be to fail early, right? So if you can... Uh, fail in the discovery phase rather than out here, you'll save a huge amount of money. And not only fail, but identify better, those, those better compounds and only uh, progress the better compounds to market. So we, we would like to put forth that there's new ways to toxicity toxic testing in the 21st century. The gold standard, of course, is in vivo animal testing, but there are some costs to that, namely time and money. And there's also this full concordance with human data. So looking for alternative methods, uh, especially that can be done early, uh, so turning to in vitro cell-based assays, which will reduce animal uh, use and cost. You can assay multiple chemicals and metabolites early. You can evaluate me mechanism of toxicity and then kinetics and dose response uh, very early in the discovery process. So one of those tools is stem cells uh, for toxic, one of those in vitro tools will be stem cells for toxicity toxic testing. Um, and there are a variety of ways to get at stem cells. There's adult stem cells, embryonic stem cells, 
IPS stem cells and cancer stem cells. And we're going to be talking about a couple of examples of these stem cells um, and how you might uh, derive them. And there's a number of vendors on the market that actually provide these, uh, this, these different stem cells, and we, we collaborate with them, and as well as Beckwin, who is going to show us how to uh, make better you know, stem cells if you want to do it yourself. So at that point, I'd like to talk, turn this over to uh, Mike, uh, who will talk about optimization of stem cell culture and differentiation through automation and imaging. Mike? Great. Thank you, Grisha. I will pull up some slides here. Okay. So uh, thanks again, Grisha, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, everyone, for attending today. As Grisha uh, mentioned, I'll be talking a little bit about some of the work we've done to optimize stem cell culture and differentiation using both automation and imaging. So the talk is basically in three uh, separate parts. Uh, the first part, we'll talk a little bit about some optimization we've done with mouse embryonic stem cell differentiation. We'll also talk about a sample preparation system that we've developed for stem cell imaging. And finally, we'll talk about larger integrated automated stem cell systems that we use to automate uh, more complex workflows. So briefly, I, I think we're all pretty familiar with uh, stem cells at this point. Uh, but again, just the reason that they're so interesting is obviously the fact that they're pluripotent and that they can become any cell type in the body. Uh, however, directing this process, this differentiation process, is actually very challenging. Uh, because they can become any cell type, it's very difficult to um, force these cells into a specific cell lineage, for example, uh, cardiomyocytes, which is the cell line that we were interested in. Uh, so we were seeking ways to try and improve this directed differentiation process. Uh, so why would these cells be valuable? Well, Grisha has already touched on that, but there are some additional applications. One can just be to study the actual uh, development process and the processes that are undertaken during stem cell differentiation. Uh, more of a futuristic uh, use would be actually cell replacement therapies. But as Grisha alluded to, what's probably the most uh, immediate use in the near future would be for drug toxicity testing, for example, determining if compounds have any effect on heart rate. And the way that this can be accomplished is because these cells can actually spontaneously contract, uh, which is hopefully shown in this region of the movie here, uh, where, again, once you have a, a plate full of cardiomyocytes, these will actually spontaneously contract. You can treat them with compounds and see if the beating rate actually changes. And Jane will speak more about this in the second half of the webinar. So just a, a brief introduction into kind of the current state of stem cell differentiation. Uh, typically, embryonic stem cells and everything that we'll be talking about uh, for our portion of the talk today was done with mouse embryonic stem cells. Uh, ESCs are typically differentiated in what are known as hanging drops, uh, shown down here, where basically droplets of cell suspensions are plated on the underside of a petri dish lid. Uh, and what uh, proceeds is then the cells more or less coalesce into the bottom of the droplet and form these spherical embryoid bodies shown here. Uh, these embryoid bodies, or EVs, are then cultured in a batch stage, uh, just in suspension culture, and then eventually adhered onto uh, either gelatin or other coated plates, allowing the cells to differentiate further. At the end of this roughly seven to eight day process, uh, the cells can then be assayed either through such methods as immunofluorescence or electrophysiology to determine the functionality of the cardiomyocytes or the other cell types of, of uh, interest. There are obviously some problems with this technique. Uh, for one, hanging drops are not very automation friendly and certainly not high throughput. This is a very uh, manual, labor intensive process. Uh, in addition, the batch stage culture of, of embryoid bodies typically results in various uh, sizes and shapes of embryoid bodies, shown kind of in this image here, where you can get small or large EVs, these kind of chains of EVs, and this can actually cause high variability in the final cell composition. So we wanted to see if there was a way we could improve upon this technique uh, using automation. So the first step was to see if we could adapt this process to a more automation-friendly method and basically see if we could form uh, embryo bodies in a microplate format. And what we found worked well was a 384-well polypropylene U-bottom plate. And the reason this was nice was that the plates actually prevented cell adherence, which allowed the cells to coalesce in the bottom of the well, uh, much like they would a normal droplet in a hanging drop. We plated 500 cells per well, and what we found was that this cell, this cell number gave us a single embryo body per well with very consistent size and shape, and that's shown over here, where out of a typical 384 well plate, we'd get about 382 single EVs and just roughly two wells that had multiple EVs. So again, a very consistent process. 
by comparison, this is an image of one of our uh, batch cultured hanging drop uh, manual methods. And again, you can see uh, much rougher embryo bodies, these chains forming, and again, likely higher variability. We also, instead of culturing them in batch cultures, did a manual hanging drop and then plated them into individual wells so that we were able to, com again, compare single embryo bodies against one another. And we used uh, the image express micro for molecular devices to actually look at shape factor to try and get an idea of the consistency of our embryo body formation. So shape factor essentially takes the shortest radius of a circle and divides it by the longest radius. So if you have a perfect circle, your shape factor should be 1. What we found was that our hanging drops done manually had a shape factor of 0.5 compared to our automated uh, uh, microplate format, which had a shape factor of 0.8. So a very significant improvement in the circularity of our embryoid bodies. Another advantage, or multiple advantages, of doing this procedure was that the microplate format greatly simplifies the differentiation process and thereby increases its throughput. So again, I mentioned hanging drops are very labor intensive, but by just plating these cells in microplates, uh, you can use automation to increase your throughput. We were also able to show that uh, this automated differentiation process produced reliable cardiomyocytes where we saw those feeding regions in over 99% of our wells. Also, we were now able to use plate-based uh, high throughput analysis equipment such as uh, high content imaging, plate readers, flow cytometers because, again, we are now able to uh, perform this in a microplate format. And finally, the ability to have a single embryoid body per well allowed us to actually screen these uh, for various conditions to see if we could improve upon our cardiomyocyte differentiation yield. So the screen that we performed was basically testing combinations of factors that are known through literature searches to be uh, positively affecting cardiomyocyte formation. So we more or less targeted known pathways uh, that are known to be involved in cardiomyocyte differentiation, such as the BMP, FGF, and WIN pathways. We also used other factors, again, uh, based on literature research, uh, that would suggest that these factors, such as ascorbic acid, would also promote cardiomyocyte formation. And we varied the times of addition of these compounds because timing can be very, um, have, have significant effects either positive or negatively, uh, depending on the time of treatment. So we tested uh, all these different factors in combination using a design of experiment approach, where we use a statistical design software to generate factorial combinations of all these different factors. The nice thing is that you can detect combination effects that you wouldn't see if you were only changing a single variable at a time. The bad uh, aspect is that you now have thousands of individual pipetting steps where each and every well is essentially different. So this is obviously not something that can easily be done manually, and so that's why uh, we were able to use automation to facilitate this. So the resulting workflow was as follows. On day zero, we used our automated assay optimization software, or AAO for short. And what this software does is really facilitate the conversion of that previous list of conditions uh, that I showed into dispense volumes, essentially an Excel sheet that has dispense volumes that can be read by our BioRaptor FRD dispensers shown below. On day zero, we used our uh, BioRaptor to dispense the cells and the reagents, uh, up to eight reagents at a time. And again, this uh, dispenser can dispense different volumes per well, which is what facilitated the screening approach. Uh, we then also treated the cells, again, with the BioRaptor anywhere from day zero to day four, so that we ended up with, uh, again, very different conditions across the plate of the 384 plate. On day five, we used our, our Biomech workstation to transfer the EVs uh, to the adherent plates, and we used 96 well plates to give the, the cells a little more room to grow and a little more media to work with. And then on day eight, when the assay was complete, we again used our Biomech to trypsinize the cells and stain them uh, for analysis by uh, flow cytometry on day eight. A little bit more about the automated self-staining uh, application. Uh, basically, again, this is for flow cytometry. We use our Biomac NXP Span 8 workstation, which has eight channels, uh, allowing you to actually access tubes and plates. Uh, and again, as anyone who's done flow cytometry knows, you need a number of centrifugation steps to separate the stain or the wash buffer from uh, the cell pellet. The nice thing is we were actually able to integrate a microplate centrifuge so that we could pellet the cells down and completely automate this process. Uh, the cell pellets were then resuspended using orbital shakers, and we actually had just a rack of antibodies, up to 24, uh, that could be added to the plates in any uh, permutation using a, a CSV workload, so just an Excel sheet again. Uh, just uh, some throughput examples, we were able to fix, permeabilize, and stain 192 samples using a single conjugated antibody in about five and a half hours, or 96 samples in about four hours. 
So this is just kind of a sample of what the data look like at the end of the screen. Uh, again, we use the automated cell staining that I described, and we stain for myosin heavy chain as a marker for cardiomyocytes. In the left panel, you can see our undifferentiated embryonic stem cells, which essentially had no positive staining for myosin heavy chain. Our control differentiated stem cells, which were essentially just grown to 15% FBS, and we grew them in the absence of lift for eight days. And here we got about 6% uh, cardiomyocytes, and this was sufficient to see those gaining regions I showed earlier. However, at the end of uh, a second round of screening, we were able to increase that roughly sevenfold, up to 43% of our cells were staying positively for myosin heavy chain. So 43% of our cells were essentially cardiomyocytes. And this is, again, after just two rounds of screening, the first one finding more or less the positive factors that seem to have an effect, and a second round of screening that uh, tested different concentrations. So a very powerful way of using this design of experiment to optimize stem cell differentiation. We then took this optimized condition forward and wanted to see how consistently we could uh, achieve these types of numbers. So we differentiated 96 replicate wells in our optimized condition. We processed 48 wells individually, so the sources of variability would be both or all would be biological, uh, any staining variability, and any variability that's inherent in the analyzer. And we compared this to the remaining 48 wells uh, that would only, that after they had been pulled together, but then redistributed and processed individually. So the variability for these samples should only be the staining and analyzer variability. So the results can be seen down below where, again, we had very comparable percentages of cardiomyocytes, right around 45 to 47 percent, uh, with very low standard deviations. And our variability, again, with the individually uh, cultured and prepared samples, we had a variability of 17 percent as compared to about 8% for our pooled samples. What this means is that only 9.4% variability was due to essentially biological variability. So what this shows is that our automated system was able to lower the biological variability of a highly complex three-dimensional culture system to less than 10%, really just showing some of the power of uh, the reproducibility of automation. So to conclude this portion of the talk, I've hopefully shown you that uh, through using automation, we improved our mouse embryonic stem cell differentiation consistency, both by looking at circularity as well as the final uh, cell composition. And also by using our design of experiment optimization, uh, we were able to improve cardiomyocyte yield sevenfold. And there's more information on this uh, in our uh, publication in the journal Biomolecular Screening. So for the second portion of the talk, I'd just like to talk a little bit about our sample preparation system that we've been using to uh, facilitate stem cell imaging. So you can imagine a variety of uses uh, for imaging within this whole entire eight-day process that I've already described. In day zero, you could use imaging to test whether your uh, embryonic stem cells are still pluripotent using uh, pluripotency stains or live stains. Um, you can use uh, the imager anywhere from day zero through four when you're using these different permutations of conditions to look at cell viability, just looking at embryo body size, for example. I've already shown on day five how we use uh, the imager to uh, assess embryo body circularity and look for consistency in that. And on day eight, while we use flow cytometry for the assay, you could certainly uh, imagine using an imager to uh, assay for your cardiomyocyte yield or cardiomyocyte functionality. So what are some advantages of moving to an imaging platform from, say, flow cytometry? Well, for one, these are adherent cells. Um, now, while we grew our cells in embryo bodies, a lot of people are starting to move into more monolayer differentiation, and if that's the case, the cells could immediately be assayed using uh, an imager rather than having to trypsonize the cells to make them a cell suspension. In addition, if folks are doing uh, induced pluripotent stem cell reprogramming, a fair amount of that is actually just done visually looking to see if uh, uh, colonies are showing the proper morphology for IPS reprogramming, and again, that's something that can be done using imaging. You also have the advantage of being able to remove the centrifugation step from any staining procedures. Uh, if you're doing this in an automated fashion, this takes out the cost of trying to integrate a microplate centrifuge. So again, a nice advantage there. Finally, you get more information uh, from imaging than you often do from flow cytometry because you can get subcellular localization or subcellular structure information. For example, if you wanted to stain for uh, pluripotency factors, you can also test to make sure they're localized in the nucleus and they are therefore functional. There are some disadvantages with imaging. For one, the analysis is slightly more involved than it typically is with flow cytometry, and that's because of this additional layer of information that you're able to uh, achieve. And also, the workflow is really only slightly less tedious. There's still a number of 
uh, buffer exchanges, antibody changes, et cetera. So it's still a very labor-intensive and tedious process. So that's why we sought to automate this process as well. And for this, we turn to our Biomac 4000 automation workstation shown below. Uh, this is a flexible platform that can be used for multiple applications, but we'll really just talk about one right now, uh, which is our self-staining application. Again, this is designed to be a flexible workflow that's used for staining adherent cells, and it can automate all the steps that we typically associate with self-staining, the fixation, permeabilization, blocks, multiple washes, uh, multiple staining steps, whether it's antibodies, nuclear dyes, or viability dyes, and even adding mounting media if that's so desired at the end. Uh, also, we, we developed it to basically be as easy and flexible uh, as possible. So uh, this will basically show you the, the walk through the, the software. Uh, initially, you would uh, select a sample pattern. If you had a full plate, you would select all 96 wells. But if you only had a partial plate, you just highlight the wells that have cells that you want to stain. You then you move to our user interface where you would select the staining permutations, whether you want to uh, remove the media, fix, and permeabilize the cells. Or if you're staining live cells, you would just deselect these steps and then move on straight uh, to the number of stains you want to use, anywhere from one to eight at a time. And then what your final uh, processing should be, whether it's in a, a final in PBS or in mounting media. Once you've selected your permutations, uh, the next step uh, pops up a reagent calculator, which shows you the volumes of the various reagents that you've selected based on the volumes you've selected to add. And also, you can also set the incubation time for each of these steps. And then as soon as this pops up and you have your reagent set up, you just click go and come back later and when your samples have been processed. So the nice thing is you really don't require any automation experience to run this application. Now, we actually did leave the software open. What we found is typically we think we've thought of everything, but invariably someone needs to change something to make it work for their specific workflow. So we did leave the application open for changes. For example, if someone wants to use 384 well plates instead of 96 well plates, you can simply go to the instrument setup and change the labware that's associated with the staining process. You can even change the order of the steps. For example, if you wanted to move your staining steps up above the fixation or up above the uh, permeabilization step, if you wanted to uh, stain for an external marker and then uh, uh, finish with a, a nuclear stain, all you have to do is drag and drop these uh, steps. Finally, your pipetting techniques may need to be customized. We've essentially set it up for the fixation step to work with paraformaldehyde. But if you wanted to fix with methanol, for example, it might actually be dripping with the current setup. So all you would have to do is go to the actual transfer step, select the uh, technique, and change it, possibly adding a larger air gap so that your methanol doesn't drip. And again, this is something that our field application scientists can also help you with. So a very flexible um, platform. This just shows some of the data we generated using the system. Uh, these are mouse embryonic stem cells that are also co-cultured with feeder cells. And again, these are images taken with the Image Express Micro. Uh, we actually use a reagent called Perfix, which is a fix and permeabilization buffer all in one, and one that doesn't even need to be removed or washed off before adding the reagent. So it's a very simple uh, process. We stain the cells with four Nanog and SOX2, uh, shown here in green and blue, and then also added mounting media containing Daffy, shown here in red, for a merged image up above. Uh, the process took about one hour to stain 58 wells in this case. So a very comparable positive yield of right around 60% for both Nanog and SOX2, very low standard deviations and variability, again indicating not only a consistent uh, culture condition, but also consistent staining and analysis. This also looks at our cardiomyocyte differentiation, essentially the same procedure I described earlier. Uh, here we took our eight, day eight differentiated embryonic stem cells, both under control conditions and treated. Uh, we then had to trypsinize our embryo bodies that had been adhered and replate them so that we could get a monolayer so it would be easier to analyze. And we stained them in 24 hours later, again, for myosin heavy chain and DAPI. Now, what you'll see is we did not get 43% positive staining over here, but that's really because the cardiomyocytes do not handle the trypsinization process well. But what you can see is, again, that the trend is there where we have certainly increased the number of green cardiomyocytes when compared to our, our control conditions. So to conclude this portion of the talk, uh, just described our self-staining application for our Biomech 4000 workstation. Again, we sought out to make it highly flexible, so that it would be uh, adaptable for any uh, self-staining need, and would also save much time and effort for scientists and have a complete walk-away solution. It should also be able to help decrease errors for complex workflows and also improve reproducibility by having less variability between users. 
And I've shown some data that where we are able to utilize this for assaying stem cell pluripotency, differentiation, and even down below, uh, we looked at apoptosis where uh, we treated the cells with storosporine and stain for an X and 5. So for the third and final portion of my talk, I'll just talk a little bit more about some of our integrated stem cell systems and some of the workflows we've automated on these as well. So everything I've talked to up till now has essentially been finding ways to um, increase your cardiomyocyte yield and then also assay either the cardiomyocytes or your starting stem cell population. But if you actually want to use these cardiomyocytes for screening, you're likely going to need a higher throughput. Uh, so obviously, having an optimized condition that gives you a greater yield is advantageous, but you'll still likely need more plates than just a single plate. You'll also likely want a steady supply, uh, so maybe not just cells due on one day, but uh, cells that are ready in consecutive days. Now, for an eight-day differentiation process, this can become pretty complex, where you would eventually stagger your initial cell plating by a single or a few days uh, to have cells ready on day eight, day nine, and day ten. But what you can quickly tell is on day two, you have to remember to treat your first round while plating your third round of cells. And this can become very complex very quickly, so you want a way of tracking plates to see where they are at various stages in the workflow. So for this, we've used our integrated stem cell system uh, that we have in the lab. And this is basically kind of a typical way that you would automate a complex workflow. So the hardware components are as follows. Basically, we used a Biomec FXP workstation, one of our liquid handlers. And encase it in a HEPA filtered enclosure, which is, uses positive pressure to maintain the sterile sterility of the workstation. Uh, to the right, barely seen over here, is, uh, is the cytomat incubator, where we uh, cultured our cells at 37 degrees C and 5% CO2. To the left, not shown, was the cytomat hotel, where we would store additional plates and tips. And shown here is the Vicel XR cell viability analyzer, which is what we use to uh, basically quantify the number of our viable cells that we would then use this answer to drive the pipetting uh, for our cell packaging steps. You also obviously need a software component. So we have really two uh, scheduling softwares. One is SAMI EX. This is what you would use for a single process that uses multiple plates or families. So again, if I was just treating my uh, stem cells this day, but I had eight different plates, we would use SAMI EX to bring the cells out of the cytomat and drive the uh, liquid handler. Also, we have our SAMI process management, which is shown to the bottom right. And this is what's uh, used for sequential processes that occur over days and weeks. So this is where you need it for a complex workflow. Essentially, what's shown here is, a, say, a day zero plating step followed by a two-day incubation, and my day uh, two treating step followed by a three-day incubation, and this would be followed by my transfer to adherent plate. Uh, what this then does is generate a calendar that shows all the different um, use all the different uh, treatments that you have to do on any given day and essentially uh, shows you the schedule and uh, make sure that your uh, liquid handler is not being overbooked, so to speak. And so, again, it will keep track of all the plates at the various stages and then describe what needs to be done on a given day. So we use the system to uh, first initially maintain our stem cells, basically uh, feed and passage the cells. And we compared the, the cell culture over 10 consecutive passages to what I was able to do manually. And what's shown below is essentially a viability and stem cell pluripotency, a viability as determined by our Vicel XR, again, tripan blue staining in essence. And the pluripotency was measured uh, using SSEA1 positive uh, flow cytometry staining. And what you can see is that the cell cultures over 10 passages maintained above 90% viability and 90% pluripotency. In addition, the cultures remain sterile over this uh, 10 passages without the use of antibiotics, again, indicating that the HEPA filtered enclosure was sufficient to maintain sterility. We also then moved on to automate our stem cell differentiation process, the same eight-day process I've described previously. And for this, we ran two batches of plates with two plates each, so for a total of 768 wells. Uh, we staggered the batches by one day, and we used the Biomech FXP in the enclosure for all the steps, the plating, the treatment, and the transfer of the embryo bodies uh, for the eight-day procedure. At the end of the eight days, I visually observed uh, which wells had beating cells in it and saw the following results. Basically, we had a single embryo, or we had an embryo body present in over 99% of the wells, and we saw beating cells in over 75 or 66% of the wells in the two batches. This likely would have been higher, but uh, the cells had just been bought out, so it's likely more some biology issues more than automation. But again, uh, very low CVs, even uh, as low as 10% for the beating, and as low, less than 1% to right around 1% for the embryo bodies uh, being present. 
So this was a, a great automated system, but it was pretty exhausting actually just visually observing the feeding wells. So what would have made this even better would have been if we had uh, had an integrated analyzer such as uh, the Image Express. So obviously if you can integrate any sort of analyzer, whether it's a plate reader, an imager, uh, anything like that, you can actually automate the entire assay process. And that's essentially shown uh, down here below, which is one of the setups we did for a customer where we used a robotic arm to take the plates from the BioFX onto a plate washer and then place them into an Image Express Ultra to automate the entire workflow. Uh, you can imagine this being applied for a cardiomyocyte assay where you could either stain for cardiomyocytes in an endpoint assay, such as the myosin heavy chain staining, or you can look at the cardiomyocyte functionality using calcium flux assays. And again, Jane will actually show some data where they uh, perform this assay. And finally, you can even use these, uh, this an integrated imager to monitor pluripotency of your stem cells using such live pluripotency stains um, and mo maintain your, your, or monitor your culture maintenance. So to conclude this portion, uh, integrated, I showed that an integrated system allows the automation of more complex workflows uh, over multiple days. We also uh, automated the feeding, passaging, and differentiation of our mouse embryonic stem cells and also showed how the integration of an analyzer or an imager can certainly increase the power of these systems. So to conclude the talk overall, the first section I uh, showed how automation was able to improve the differentiation consistency of our embryonic bodies as well as our eventual cardiomyocytes and how using the uh, optimization assays we were able to increase the cardiomyocyte yield. Um, for the second portion, uh, I showed how we have developed a simple and flexible automated cell staining platform to help facilitate the sample preparation for stem cell or really any cell imaging. And for the third, third portion, I showed how uh, we, used, we automated our stem cell culture, differentiation, and screening systems using a, a larger integrated system for more complex workflows. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank the people responsible. Uh, Dr. Lee Liu uh, was basically the one who developed the uh, cell staining application for the Biomech 4000. Amy Yoder developed the automation for flow cytometry staining. And Dr. Laura Pajak was kind of the guiding force of our uh, stem cell program. I'd also like to thank our integrated solutions group, who uh, the brilliant engineers uh, set up the uh, integrated stem cell system in the lab. Uh, that was uh, an integral for our third portion of the talk. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention, and I'll turn it over to Jane to talk a little bit more about high-content imaging tools for cardiotoxicity screening. Thank you. Uh, just a moment here while I get my application shared. All right, that was a great detailed presentation about the workflow of um, stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes. Now I'll talk um, more specifically about some of the imaging applications that we've shown here. The outline of my talk, first I will show you some a presentation. We used induced pluripotent stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes, and these are from humans. We purchased them already differentiated and used them in all the studies that I'll show in this talk. I'll show you a multi-parameter cytotoxicity assay showing not only cell viability or, you know, gross toxicity effects, but also um, a targeted mechanism toxicity. In this case, I'll show you the mitochondrial membrane potential toxicity assay. And in addition to that, some exciting results where we were looking at the beat rate using imaging, taking videos of the cardiomyocytes feeding. And at the end, I'll, I'll show you a little bit of a small screening effort we did with, uh, for high content imaging with the cardiotoxicity compound library. To orient you a little bit, I'll show you the, um, all the data I'll be showing you is from our automated image acquisition, the Image Express micro system, so um, automated microscope. We also have a confocal system called Image Express Ultra, and the software used is Meta Express, which not only drives the instrumentation, but allows you to easily analyze the images that you get from the instrument. All of the data, all of the images, and all of the analyzed data is saved in our MVC store database. I'll talk a little bit about our Acute Express software, which takes the image analysis data and plots it into IC50 curves, allows you to do self-organizing maps, a lot of different things that the um, screening community especially would like to see. 
a quick um, review of the workflow. As Beckman already showed you, you can use their biomet systems for either pre-coding your microplates, feeding the cells onto the microplates, and um, then treating with the compounds, and finally staining the cells with the mix of dyes and doing the wash steps. In our assay, I kind of show a little bit about the, uh, the time sequence this takes. Generally, from beginning to end with these um, cardiomyocytes, the assay is about a week or so. Part of that is that the cells need to grow for three to seven days before you start using them so that you can see the contraction. Then we would acquire the images either at 10x or 20x using Image Express Micro. And finally, analyze those images using MetExpress software and some of the modules. The um, cells for the multiparametric toxicity assay on these cardiomyocytes, the cells were stained with calcium AM to show us cell viability, with a mitotracker orange to show mitochondrial membrane potential integrity, and then with a simple Herx stain to <laughs> show um, the nuclear morphology to dye the nuclei. And I apologize if you can hear our gardeners right outside the window. Um, this, this image shows you what the control wells would look like with high viability. You can view the mitochondria in orange and you can get a nuclear count for um, cell segmentation, for easier cell segmentation. Then with increasing doses of this compound, idorubicin, over 24 hours, you can see the effect on both the cell morphology, the cell density, and also the um, integrity of the mitochondria. To delve a little bit deeper into the mechanistic assay, for mitochondria toxicity, before I showed you results with mitotracker, but this is a different reagent called JC10. The way JC10 works is that if the membrane potential is maintained in, for example, the control wells on the left, the orange, the, the dye remains in the mitochondria and fluoresces orange. The J aggregates fluoresce in orange. If the compound, such as antimycin A, disrupts the membrane potential of the mitochondria, the dye leaks out and the monomeric form in the cytoplasm fluoresces in green. For people who may not be quite so familiar with imaging assays and the analysis, now I've removed the green overlay and I've also brightened it up, just falsely brightened it so to show the results better and magnified it. On the left are untreated cardiomyocytes, showing you can see a lot of mitochondria in the image. They're bright, they're retained, in, the dye is retained in the mitochondria. On the right hand side, the treated cells show very little mitochondria. Now, with the image analysis, program, and in this case I used a um, available application module from us, it can identify not only the individual mitochondria, you can look at individual mitochondria or you can look at total mitochondria, there are a lot of different um, cell outputs that you can get on a per cell or a per well basis. And this is the result of an experiment where we treated with a compound at different doses in replicates and I read the plate after adding JC10 and after compound treatment for an hour and a half, for 90 minutes, 150, and 280 minutes. And this shows how your curve will shift. With the increasing doses of antimycin A at the right, you're seeing fewer and fewer mitochondria, and even over time, at the lower doses of antimycin A, the membrane potential is disrupted and you see you're counting fewer and fewer mitochondria over time. Another assay that I'll show you from um, that was mentioned before is you can look at the effect on the cell beat rate. So these mature living cardiomyocytes are plated, like I said, for maybe five or six days until you get a synchronized beating in the well. And maybe I didn't mention all these assays. I think all of the assays I'm showing you were done in 384 well plate. Early on we did some in 96. So they're very amenable to scale up. The cardiomyocytes are loaded with a fluorescent dye. Then we put them in the imager, which has environmental control, so they can be kept warm and under CO2 um, controlled conditions. In the top, there's two ways that we've shown it. In the top, we show calcium AM, a live cell dye, where it just stains these live cardiomyocytes and you can visualize them beating. And we can take a video of this over time. 
the bottom we've loaded them with a calcium calcium five dye, which will measure the flux of calcium in and out of the cell, and this correlates to their beating rate also. The way we analyze the top image, where we just stain the live cell with um, a live cell dye, is when you select a video, a time-lapse video, it looks like a film strip, basically. And what we did is we compared one image to the one before it, and we compared the brightness and, and area of the perimeters of the cells um, against each other over time in that time-lapse. This allows you to do is plot this on a, on a time versus intensity curve or time versus area curve. And you can see that in the top graph we have some control wells showing a specific beat rate, and the bottom graph we have compound added that causes an increase in the beat rate. And this correlated exactly with what you would expect for some of the compounds we added, such as epinephrine and isoparanol, you can actually plot a dose response curve. So increasing amounts of those compounds cause increased beat rate. The other way we can do this with the calcium flux assay on the left, it shows a control untreated well, and you can plot the intensity um, fluctuations as the calcium is, is pumped out of the cell, goes in and is pumped out of the cell. In the middle, epinephrine increases the beat rate, and verapamil decreases it to roughly uh, once every, or about four times a minute. And this is another very easy way for you to quantitate effects of compounds on the beat rate of cardiomyocytes. Now, the reason this is important is because something that affects the, um, the viability of the assay, something that affects the beat rate of the assay may or may not affect the viability of the cells. For example, it gives, so it gives you much more information. For example, on the left, we show cytotoxicity just with the calcium AM live cell dye. After treatment, you can see that, for look at the green dots yeah. first for haloperidol, and you'll see there's really no effect on the toxicity over, after treatment over 24 or 48 hours. Well, did you see it? This is a 24-hour graph. Versus the beat rate on the right-hand side, which shows that even in a few, few minutes with haloperidol, you see a marked effect on the beat rate of the cardiomyocytes. After that, we, we purchased a targeted compound library for cardiotoxic effects and tested those in 384 well plates using these induced pluripotent stem cells. And what this shows are some heat maps from the software. So MedExpress it allows you to quickly see um, where you have outliers, and in this case, outliers are could be hits of some sort. The compounds will run in duplicate. And I'm just showing you example heat maps that could show you, you can look quickly at different parameters. For example, the top one might be um, nuclear size. The middle one could be your mitochondrial membrane potential. And the bottom one could be um, cell density, something like that. It also allows you to see dose response curves or if your control wells are working. On, on the right-hand side, you can see that we ran a dose response curve, for example, columns 13 through 16 in quadruplicate starting at a high level at the top and decreasing as you go down, and that's readily apparent in your heat map. A little bit about the Image Express Micro, which I used for this assay, is that you can get an Image Express Micro with many different options. You can choose the um, camera or the detector that you want. It has multiple light source options. The instrument can hold up to five filter cubes at one time that are really easy to change out by the user. And it can hold up to four objectives at one time between one and 100x magnification based on your needs. If you're simply doing a live dead assay or something like that, you may only need a four or a 10x objective where you'd rather count a large number of cells in one field. But if you're looking at something such as mitochondria, per cell, you may want a um, higher magnification objective. The instrument, using an automated system like this, it's very fast for you. You can do more than 1536 wells per hour. Also, the instrument can read even slides, tissue slides, or up to 1536 well plates. And some of the options available, you can purchase it to do single edition fluidics or 
to do transmitted light for unlabeled cells. It can come with uh, environmental control and, of course, it's automation friendly. For the image analysis portion, it's very flexible. You can acquire um, your images and analyze with one of the application modules that there we have that are for some of the very common applications people are using, such as measuring the cell cycle or to look at cell scoring, just whether one cell has one color, two colors, three colors, or to look at translocations, for example, for intracellular trafficking. For genotoxicity assays, you may want to see if you have um, micronuclei or binucleate cells, and there are many more, including measuring your eye outgrowth. But if one of the modules that are available doesn't suit your needs, you can still write your own custom module. And in the custom module, you can use the um, existing application modules to get you started, or you can start from scratch. And in this case, I'm showing a custom module where someone wanted to identify the mitotic spindles in the centrosomes in every cell. Uh, the custom modules, once written, can be saved and shared among different people or reused or opened up and edited for different dyes, things like that. In conclusion, um, I showed you some of the image-based cardiomyocyte assays we've done. I did, what I didn't show is, um, but can certainly be done on imaging, as Beckman did show, is that you can monitor differentiation in the maturity of the stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes using some of the cardiomyocyte-specific markers. We've done this before and shown it previously, such as showing alpha activin in this image is present in the cardiomyocytes then um, you can assess multiple parameters of cell toxicity at one time in one well, multiple colors, and you can get a lot of different information. You can look at overall viability or different mechanistic, mechanistic toxicity, and also the ex pretty exciting application is you can look at the contraction dynamics. And we've shown that you can screen a compound library on the Image Express uh, Micro. I mean, not only us, lots, many of our customers are doing large compound screens every day. I would like to acknowledge Inside Molecular Devices, some people from our product development and assay development department, Oksana Surenko, Evan Cromwell, and Gabrielle Mikaveshis, and then from marketing also Carol Crittenden. And then the cells that I showed you here were acquired from a company called Cellular Dynamics International, and I'd like to thank them for all of their help at Cellular Dynamics, Blake Anson, Kobe Carlson, and Susan DeLora. And now I think we still have time for questions. I'll pass it back to Grisha to uh, monitor the questions. Thank you very much, Jane and Mike. Great talk. Uh, nice nice uh, subject. Let me uh, just remind the audience about um, um, how to uh, submit a question. As I mentioned earlier, um, go to the uh, Q&A button, type in a question, choose all panelists. Um, and send that to us. And let me, uh, unfortunately, I need to pull up the, you're going to see a little bit of a, a waffle on your screen as I pull up the Q&A uh, window to, um, to look at the questions come in. So, um, yep, we got a couple already. Uh, for Mike, well, what other cell types can this method for stem cell differentiated, differentiation be applied to? Uh, that's a very good question. Again, our, our focus was predominantly on cardiomyocytes, but the optimization type assays, again, that could certainly be applied to any of a variety of uh, stem cell or differentiated cell types. Um, uh, so, again, it's really what we were focusing on was strictly cardiomyocytes, but the, the process should really work um, for anything. And, again, uh, automating the whatever manual process that someone is currently using with their stem cell differentiation should certainly be doable. Uh, and sort of a, a related question was, have you um, tried with human embryonic stem cells? And I'll let Mike answer and then have Jane remind the audience about the types of cells she used. So Mike first. Sure. Uh, yeah, so we basically uh, – tried to follow up with a, a single commercially available human IPS cell line that we were able to acquire. That we actually had some difficulties with. What we found was that that at least particular cell line, we were unable to really get kind of a baseline 
differentiation into cardiomyocytes. So if we would essentially treat with the same treatment in different wells, we would get very different results. So I think that was really just a case of, uh, I think we were kind of lacking uh, the, the a collaborator who had a pretty well-established differentiation protocol for cardiomyocytes, then if we had that kind of baseline, we could then use the optimization screen on top of that. But again, without being able to have a, a very reliable baseline, doing this type of optimization screen was essentially meaningless. So uh, that's still something we're pursuing, but uh, at the moment, that's, uh, the IPSLs have not been as, uh, as conducive to uh, this, this process as the ESDs have thus far. But again, I really think that's more our, our lack of a, a good starting point with those uh, those commercial cells. And Jane, a reminder on the cells that you were using? We were using already um, terminally differentiated um, induced pluripotent stem cell cardiomyocytes from cellular dynamics. But mm -hmm. um, a little bit to, to add is that, that we've, used, we've used different ones of their stem cell derived cells also. And for example, within with the different cells, even though they're terminally differentiated, when you plate them, they do mature over time, and we can measure like increasing amounts of sort of maturity markers, such as um, the appearance of receptors on the neurons as, as the cells are, are plated and grow. Got it. That Question, for Jane. Yep. Question for Jane. Yep. Question for Jane. What other targeted or mechanistic toxic assays have you tried? And have you tried these on different uh, cell types? Okay, sure. We, um, we've, we've used um, stem cell-derived hepatocytes as well and neurons, as I just said. And we've looked at things like, well, certainly apoptosis, mitotic, mitotic arrest doesn't work on these differentiated cells, but um, phospholipidosis, steatosis for the neurons, we look at different effects on the morphology, on the outgrowth, the branching or the length of the outgrowth or number per cell, things like that. Got it. Um, Mike, uh, when, at what throughput or when do you recommend, you know, going from a manual to an automated sample test process? Uh, that's also a very good question. I think there's no magic number to me. I, I think it really kind of depends on the complexity of the workflow. So you could imagine something that's extremely easy. If you were just doing a, a single, if you just wanted to add DAPI to cells, I mean, you could imagine a very high throughput that could be done manually versus a very complex workflow that requires a variety of antibody additions for a variety of treatments uh, that really, just due to its complexity, a single plate would be worth automating. So I don't think there's necessarily a, a like I said, a magic number. I really think it could be a very low throughput for a complex process or very high throughput for a very simple process. Okay, so then speaking of throughput, what? how many, you know, if it's sticking with 96 well plates, how many 96 well plates can you process in a, in a run? Uh, you mean for the differentiation process or for the self-staining application? Self-staining application. Uh, again, that even there depends on the workflow. Um, so for the, for example, the, the cardiomyocyte stain uh, would be very simple. And, and again, I think I said essentially for the uh, nuclear stain with the conjugated antibodies, we could do roughly a plate in about an hour and 20 minutes. Um, but again, it, it could be as simple as adding a single reagent. It could be adding eight reagents with various incubation times, things like that. So again, tough to really get a, a – a, it would really depend on the workflow, I guess, is the, the short way to answer it. Got it. Uh, uh, this is a, a general question, and I think both you and Jane have, have information to provide. So uh, Mike, you can go first, and then, uh, and then Jane can fill in. Uh, how, how would you compare uh, IPSC-derived cardiomyocytes to primary cardiac muscle cells, you know, in terms of the physiological parameters, bleeding, morphology, action potentials, currents, potassium currents, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, we did not get the, that in-depth on the analysis of the, of the cells. Again, we did do some preliminary work with some of our differentiated cells, um, and you definitely could see just depending on the length of culture, some changes in the kind of maturity of the cells. Um, but we did not work with any uh, any either primary cardiomyocytes or uh, commercially available differentiated cell types like that. So I think James probably have more information. So, so Jane? Um, yeah, I, I actually would not have more information. I, I haven't done any um, cardio 
myocytes, uh, human derived or otherwise, that were primary either. I would I would hate to try to do a com I would hate to say anything about it. I would ask I would go to the vendor, I guess, of the cardiomyocytes to try to figure out what's been done. That said, we have we have some materials on our website showing certain things, not comparisons, but certain um, electrophysiology and um, marker expression that it can help convince how, how the cardiomyocytes look. Great. Uh, so um, there is a question about price for generally about price, and I think uh, that is uh, about these different products, and that is a very regional and varied question. I think both, both our companies have a uh, variety of um, versions of the, the products um, um, presented today, and um, uh, so that's a regional question to ask uh, your, your uh, local representative. But on that note, I would like to say that, go to the next slide, that we are doing a uh, co-promotion, and if you would like to learn more about that, there is a uh, the website is www.militardevices.com with a slash sell auto offer, and um, on that uh, it's about if you look into purchasing you know products from both of our uh, companies, there's um, uh, sort of a minimum discount offered, and um, we can work with you together as a team to uh, understand your needs to automate. Uh, these processes. Um, so I encourage you to look at that, and um, uh, if you're interested in pricing in your local area, they can be provided by both our companies. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, go to my last slide, which is a thank you, but I will still, if any questions come in, um, I, will, I will pull up the question and answer window in a minute. Um, so if you have additional questions for us, happy to take an uh, email. Um, I'm grisha.chandy at moldav.com. Mike is uh, N. Kowalski at Beckman.com and James Jane Hesty at Molda.com. Uh, you can learn about molecular devices, more about molecular devices at, uh, and our imaging products at highthroughputimaging.com. And um, our past webinars are posted online, uh, www.moleculardevices.com, HCS webinars. There was a question about obtaining uh, this webinar. Uh, we usually post within two weeks uh, of the initial airing, so this should be just uh, please um, check out uh, our website, but there should be um, a posting within two weeks, and um, as soon as it's posted, we send an email out to all registrants with the, the information that was posted. If you want to learn more about Beckman Coulter, it's www, and, and it's liquid handling products, www.biomech4k.com, and www.liquidhandles.com. On that note, let me pull up the Q&A and see... Um, ah, uh, let me see. Yep, so and more questions about ac uh, accessing the, the slides, and the, I mentioned that, um, 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 that um, they, they will be posted. There's a question about uh, uh, the calcium, uh, calcium oscillation experiments, and there are app notes available you just from the of dynamics or molecular devices about that on our respective websites. Um, okay, so um, on that note, please send me any other questions. Well, I think on that note, um, we're on the hour, and um, I would like to everybody for attending, um, and i um, really happy that you could uh, participate. And I um, want to thank the speakers for um, uh, making, uh, giving great talks, and would love to uh, talk to you or hear from you, um, and we will see you at our next webinar. Thank you.